Ani, bonjour, welcome everyone to the first installment of CROSH COVID Conversations. My name is Toby Mankus and I'm the Science Communication Officer at CROSH, the Center for Research in Occupational Safety and Health. We are streaming live from the CROSH lab at Laurentian University. We acknowledge the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850 and recognize that Laurentian University is located on the traditional lands of the Tikmashing and Anishinaabek. The city of Greater Sudbury also includes the traditional lands of Wanapate First Nation. CROSH COVID Conversations is a five-part webinar series on the intersection of occupational safety and health and COVID-19. The format today and for each part is as follows. Our panelists will speak for 15 minutes each and then we'll have 10 minutes of questions. You can enter your questions at any time in the chat function of the platform you're watching on. I will then ask your audience questions to our panelists during the question and answer section. Today, our topic is screening and tracking for COVID-19 and the workplace. Our panelists are Dr. Katie Goggins and Patrick James Trottier. Dr. Katie Goggins has been a postdoctoral fellow with CROSH for almost a year. Her research interests focus on the role of biomechanics, human factors, and ergonomics on industrial health and safety and occupational disease. Today, Katie will generally discuss COVID-19 workplace entrance screening, and more specifically, the temperature measurement aspect of the screening process. Thank you for joining us, Katie. Hi everyone, thanks Toby, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, in the past six months, almost everyone has gone through some sort of entrance screening protocol. Whether it's a pre-entrance questionnaire at the dentist's office, a request to hand sanitize upon entering a store, or a more elaborate workplace screening protocol involving a series of questions and potentially a temperature check. Over the spring and summer, these protocols have continued to change. And with the symptoms of COVID-19 being updated pretty regularly, the last update was on September 21st, uh, questions went from just leaving the country to leaving our province or region and others about physical distancing practices. So this evolution was expected as we are continuing to learn more about COVID-19. So it's important to set the stage uh, for this discussion with mentioning that not only our northern community, but our province and country and globally, we have very little experience with mass screening practices. And to date, the only two events in recent times that have previously warranted this style of entry protocol were the 2003 SARS outbreak and the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. And even with these events, uh, screening protocols were mainly seen at airports, uh, transit terminals, and hospitals. So as workplaces are setting up screening protocols for our current pandemic, there was a lot of learning that needs to be done. Our entrance screening protocols are designed to, to, to catch people who have potentially been exposed or are potentially symptomatic prior to them entering a public area or workplace. And the most critical control in viral transmission is to stop the, vi the virus from spreading uh, by identifying these potentially symptomatic people prior to them exposing other people. A big aspect of establishing screening programs is related to behavior change. By stopping an individual and prompting these questions, you're challenging their normal habits and forcing them to think and question their actions to that point. Have I been exposed? Have I been around someone that seemed ill? Have I traveled outside our area? And am I truly feeling well enough to be in public right now? This last part seems simple. Do I feel well? But unfortunately, we have a huge societal problem across all industries where it has become the norm to go to work sick or go to the grocery store with a cold. So by setting up these screening stations, we are clearly communicating that the expectation to enter is a state of good health. Aside from asking the questions, why are we screening for temperature? One thing we've always scientifically known is a fever is an indication that your body is fighting some form of infection. It can be viral or bacterial, a fever is an indication that our body's immune system has been triggered and your body is trying to kill the foreign virus or bacteria. V 
viruses and bacteria, uh, they can thrive when our body is at a normal temperature, but it's harder for them to survive when we have a fever. Remembering a fever is nonspecific, meaning at the point when a fever has been identified, we do not know exactly why the fever is present. To restate, a high temperature reading in a screening protocol is not a positive determination of COVID-19, but it is, is a positive indicator that the person's body is in a state of fighting something. As far as symptoms of COVID-19 are concerned, a fever is realistically one of the only symptoms we can quantify in the precise moment of a worker going through a workplace entrance screening protocol. The rest of the symptoms rely on a worker's own individual assessment and disclosure of what they're feeling or experiencing. Being able to quantify a symptom helps us feel safe. Uh, we can put a number on temperature and identify a fever. Now, if you've been to various workplaces or medical centers in the past few months, You've likely seen an array of temperature screening devices, including infrared laser thermometers and thermal imaging cameras. Unfortunately, uh, for our northern environment, most studies on these devices were not conducted in a circumstance similar to ours. For example, uh, in Sudbury, March this year had a daytime high temperature of seven degrees Celsius and a nighttime low of minus 20 degrees Celsius. So most of the literature I've read, temperature screening has not been conducted in areas with such changes in environmental temperature. A lot of research has included, <clears throat> we've included, there's so much research um, on the screening in indoor controlled environments like airports or hospitals, where in hospitals, the temperature measurement, uh, these are more a part of a protocol or ident uh, designed to identify infection or sepsis and actually take the, pat the patient's temperature every half an hour. Because of these gaps in the literature available, uh, myself and a team at Crosh have taken on various studies to relate the current research to our own environment. So one of the major questions my research team had was if we're taking temperature measurements in a screening protocol, and we don't consider the effects of the environment that person just came from, are we underestimating or overestimating people's temperatures with the laser thermometers or thermal imaging cameras? An underestimation in the winter, for example, uh, can potentially give us a false negative or a very false sense of security. And an overestimation, potentially in the summer on those, on those really hot days, may unintentionally cause us to send people home from work who don't actually have a fever at that moment. So we set out to test temperature measurement equipment, including an ear and forehead infrared contact thermometer, uh, much like the ones you see at the doctor's office, an infrared laser thermometer, like you used to be able to get at Canadian Tire, um, eye buttons, so they're a small quarter size circle you can tape to your forehead, uh, for a full day temperature measurement, and a thermal imaging camera donated to Crosh by Provix, which screens one person at a time as they walk past the camera terminal. Crosh also has an environmental chamber, and this is capable of simulating temperature and humidity combinations, so we can expose equipment and participants to the conditions that they would experience in a real life scenario. And the first set of tests we ran, we tried to simulate a person having to walk five minutes to their workplace doors to be screened. So the temperature and humidity in the chamber would be set to either, we did uh, minus 20, minus 15, minus 10, minus five, zero, five, 10, 15, and 20 degrees Celsius. Then we kept the humidity at approximately 50%. The participant would walk into the chamber wearing the clothes they would normally wear for that temperature if it was winter conditions, winter jacket and boots, summer conditions, uh, shorts and shoes. And then they would walk around in the chamber uh, for five minutes. After the five minutes was done, they would walk out of the chamber and their temperature would be taken with all of the equipment. Uh, temperatures were taken every minute until a measurement was registered. So for instance, when a participant came out of the chamber after a five minute exposure at minus 20 or minus 15, 
some of the equipment wouldn't actually register a reading because the skin surface was too cold. We also conducted experiments uh, with real environmental exposures where participants were screened outside, both in the open and then under a shaded pop-up tent if you're setting up a screening area. And the participant took their own temperature every half an hour starting at 6.30 in the morning until 7.30 at night. And so this design was meant to evaluate the effects of time of day and capture potential shift change times. This experimental protocol also incorporated illuminance measurements of the forehead surface at the time of the measurement. So as we all know, the sun conditions changed wildly in Sudbury throughout the day, and we wanted to capture the illuminance of the forehead to see how that was affecting the camera and lasers. We've conducted some smaller experiments uh, to evaluate what happens when people wear hats. We used a baseball hat, a buff for a headband, um, a hard hat, and even a winter toque. And we are also trying to evaluate differences if you're doing a drive-through style screening where your temperature will be taken in your car. Again, what are the effects of having your air conditioning or heat on in your car? combined with the sun and outdoor environmental conditions. We're not done testing or fully completed data analysis at this point. Uh, so unfortunately, we don't have statistical results to share with you. Uh, but anecdotally, I can say a few things. Um, if people are walking into your COVID-19 screening protocol from outside at temperatures of minus 10 degrees Celsius or lower, uh, they need to have the ability to acclimatize to room temperature for at least 10 minutes before you take their forehead surface measurement. This, of course, will affect how we set up entrance screening protocols for the winter months. Uh, if the employees you're trying to screen are wearing a hat, uh, their forehead surface temperature will be a little higher than normal. Again, giving them time to acclimatize to room temperature without a hat on is important for capturing a more representative forehead temperature. Uh, depending on the outdoor temperature, five minutes would be appropriate. If you are screening people in vehicles, keep in mind both the internal and external environments you're taking the measurements in. Car heat or air conditioning should be turned off. Equipment-wise, uh, the ear probe took the most consistent measurements regardless of the conditions as we had anticipated and this is why it was used as a control measurement for the experiment. Uh, when using the same tool on the forehead, it did not capture consistent measurements and often did not register any measurements when the environmental conditions were below zero. So this is also expected as these types of thermometers are designed to capture temperatures within a specified range. We tested the infrared laser thermometers at different distances uh, as indicated with their calibration certificate and user manual. So the laser performed best two feet, four feet, or six feet from the surface of the measurement according to the manual for this particular one. And we found no significant change in the temperature measurements resulting from the different distances to the participant. So this means depending on the type of infrared laser, uh, as deemed acceptable for its performance in the user manual, you could select one that would allow a screener to maintain a physical distance of six feet from the workers that they're screening. The I buttons were great for a laboratory setting or a workplace for full day measurement but would not be appropriate for instantaneous temperature measurements on numerous people. They were really nice for our lab, but that's about the practicality of them. And the thermal imaging camera was very user-friendly, but the environmental conditions for its use have to really be considered. So the camera doesn't pick up the person properly outdoors in sunlight uh, for outdoor screening with a camera, the outdoor temperature and lighting conditions would need to be considered. <clears throat> So overall, uh, it is important to remember the purpose of incorporating temperature screening at a workplace or public space entrance. We would like to try and make sure that at that moment, nobody's entering a, worse play, a workplace symptomatic with a fever. In order to ensure we don't underestimate or overestimate temperatures, we have to think about the screening area to incorporate physical distancing measures. 
our screening environment, the temperature and lighting conditions, and the environment from which our workers are just leaving. Again, we've not finished our data collection or analysis, but as soon as we have some peer-reviewed results, we are going to make this readily available for everyone on the CROSH website. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in today, and I'm going to hand it back to Toby. Thank you very much, uh, Kitty, for uh, sharing that with us. And uh, we've got some great questions for you uh, coming up in the question and answer. Okay, our next panelist is Patrick J. Trottier. And Patrick is a fourth year Bachelor of Computer Science student at Laurentian University. Patrick's been working with Grosh on projects involving virtual reality and occupational health and safety topics such as line of, such as line of sight and fall prevention. Today, Patrick will be discussing the technology around tracking COVID-19 and how it applies to the workplace. Thank you for joining us, Patrick. Hello, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. So today we'll be exploring COVID contact tracing. We'll start off by learning about the traditional contact tracing method. Afterwards, we'll talk about the app-based contact tracing systems and finally finish off with the implications for these app-based uh, contact tracing systems, particularly in terms of the workplace. So let's start off. You know, contact tracing itself what it really is all about is helping to understand the spread. So what you would do in a traditional sense is you would go to an interview and answer some questions to find out where the person was, and that can help inform uh, populations that could have been affected by the person who was infected. Um, but there's a bit of a problem with using a you know, question-based uh, approach like this, particularly in terms of participant memories. The person has to remember where they were. So a couple of people got together, especially more recently uh, since COVID, and thought, can we do something better? Is there a better way we can approach this? Or perhaps just another way. So what some people have come up with is using your phone to help you. Because after all, your phone knows a lot about you. Uh, it has GPS, so you can track where someone went, and all kinds of other gadgets. And we'll talk about how those are used to uh, do some contact tracing. So in particular, as uh, COVID swept through other countries, many of them resorted to apps that are based on location. What they do, they map out your location, you leave your GPS on, and uh, it tells exactly where you were. So it's perfect for contact tracing because it's very, very uh, precise and accurate. The issue being, it's very, very privacy invasive. And on top of that, if you're using GPS, you do uh, have a bit of problems with indoor use because uh, it really needs a line of sight with the sky for optimal usage. So how do we fix that? Well, this is where the contact tracing apps really come in. And we're going to talk to today particularly about the COVID alert system, which is the Canadian uh, COVID contact tracing effort. Now, this app is actually uh, based on an Apple, or rather a historic partnership between Apple and Google that builds a foundation for contract tracing systems. So uh, once, once they use this framework, they were able to build an app that anyone can review and see how it works. So therefore you can verify that it does what it is, it says. But what is it all about? What does it do and how does it respect your privacy, especially compared to the location aware versions of these apps? Well, let's think of it in terms of a costume party. We're going to a party and everyone's wearing a costume. Now, every five minutes, you have to tell everyone what your costume is, all right? And that is uh, problematic though, because you're telling people, you know, uh, I'm wearing you know, such and such costume uh, because they can kind of follow you around. Now that's how uh, some technology works. This update that Apple and Google released actually allows us to do a little bit of a trickery. Every 15 minutes now, we can change our costume, our unique identifier. So therefore, it makes it harder for people to follow us, to track us. Well, and let's talk a little bit more specifically in terms of technology. So this contact tracing app for COVID alert actually happens wirelessly. 
It uses a protocol called Bluetooth. So Bluetooth is a short range wireless uh, signal, if you will. It's up to about 30 meters in range. So it's ideal because it isn't too great. So when you think of your home internet, Wi-Fi expands your whole house. That's such a great, great big area. So it's very impractical to use that for something closer to the two meter uh, physical distancing calculations, if you will. Now, with Bluetooth, what's going to happen, it's going to act a bit like your costume. So Bluetooth, what it does is it broadcasts an identifier of your phone, a uh, unique identifier costume, if you will, but changes every 15 minutes. And so if you're nearby, well, your phone's going to be listening to all the identifiers that other phones are saying and holding, keeping track of them. And then what it does is it checks a list on the internet of people that were infected. So once you get infected, you receive a code from your physician. And then you can write in that code and upload the entries. The entries don't tell us anything about where you were, but if a phone was listening, as I said, well, it'll know that it was near you. And that's enough for the contract tracing effort of these applications. So it's a sort of a more privacy respecting uh, method of undertaking this. So what does this mean, uh, particularly in terms of the workplaces and schools and such like that? Well, let's probably start off by considering, well, how effective is it, right? So some researchers uh, have shown that about 60% or so uh, usage in the population would be, would be ideal or more. Always more, uh, the more we can have, the better, as always, for these kinds of things. Um, and we have shown numbers from yesterday actually showing the app uh, surpassed 3 million downloads. Now, if we put that compared to the uh, population of Ontario, it runs out to about 22%. So we're not really close to that 60%. But again, the more the better is what the researchers have shown. Now, the thing about this downloads and what the numbers I gave is that this is actually Canada-wide uh, system. So I can't say that 22% of Ontario is actually using it, unfortunately. On top of that, 3 million downloads, uh, the way app stores work and the way the app works itself, they're privacy respective, so we actually don't know about specific usage, just the downloads. So, but we do know throughout the month of August, every day about 80 to 100 people uh, tested positive for COVID in Ontario. And in that same period of time, only about 90 people reported uh, their diagnosis with the app. There might be a couple of reasons for that. So the first thing is um, it's something called an operating system. It's really the foundation that, of the interactions between the physical device and I want to say the internal device, but think of it more like the interface you use to, to tap to play games and such like that. The operating system, kind of the bridge between both. Uh, and what the big props uh, issue is it actually requires you to have a phone that's made by Google or Apple within the last five years. On tech, that's like a century, I think. My numbers are correct. Um, what that means though, really is even if your phone has Bluetooth, it needs to be recent enough to get this particularly up, particular update. And the update, the, uh, the important part of that update to know is that it lets the app run in background. And that's important because we don't want it to disturb you while you're doing things. You don't want to be playing a game and having this thing come in the foreground or come right into you and say, oh, you know, let's, uh, let's do a contact tracing test right now. And every 15 minutes or five minutes, it does that. So that's why it's important it runs in the background and the update was required to make that happen. But unfortunately, it wasn't released to phones that were much older than five years. Additionally, the issue with the internet connection, that's pretty problematic for you, have, for you to have to check uh, those, that list, that database of infected people. Um, if, you have, if you're in a rural area and other people who perhaps don't have quite as readily an internet connection, we can run into issues there. Good news is no location is needed for the app. And I want to uh, emphasize that the app itself. Unfortunately, on Android, uh, it requires a location to be on. So you might have noticed that if you are using the application. Um, so the thing to be careful there is making sure your other apps, perhaps if you're not comfortable with your location being on, perhaps change the settings on those apps to help with that. Um, 
Now, the other thing too is remember, this is wireless technology. And this actually has a couple potential um, well, issues, if you will. The first being uh, wireless interference in both senses. When you're in a room and you're perhaps in your home, you know, Wi-Fi doesn't work in this in the spot of the house, you know, and you just deal with it. But that actually happens with Bluetooth too. It doesn't go well through a wall necessarily as much as it would through the air. So uh, that's something to consider. If it's trying to figure out if you're two meters away, it might get a little bit confused. It might say, oh, you're 30 meters away, but in fact, you're just on the other side of the wall, but just because it's based on the signal strength. So that's a bit problematic. The other thing too, in some work environments, you know, there's radio sensitive technology there. Thinking of planes, for instance, and others. And that's actually problematic because you wouldn't want the, uh, the tracking to inter the tracing rather to interfere with those procedures. So what I'm getting at is this uh, application is very convenient for people to you know, just have it in your pocket, have it run while you wander around and get those interactions. But it may not be suitable for all the environments because, well, it may not be made to work in those environments. So it's something to, to, to consider. And after all, an app itself, uh, particularly like this one, isn't actually sufficient to prevent you from getting anything or to prevent uh, the virus itself. You need a little bit more. And so it's important to supplement these with existing strategies and principles. So today we were focusing on the traditional contact tracing and then augmenting it with the app-based contact tracing. And we touched a little bit on the implications of the app. I'd like to take a moment to thank Dr. Sandra Dorman, Dr. Allison Godwin, Toby Mankus, and Courtney Lessel for their support and helping me get ready for this presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, so we've got uh, several audience questions, which we have uh, now have time for. And so we'll bring everyone into the stream. And uh, the first question is for Dr. Katie Goggins. Uh, Katie. Uh, could you comment on the camera system? Um, I think that's the thermal imaging system versus, say, other monitoring systems on perhaps like effectiveness. Uh, sure. So on the effectiveness, I guess for the camera systems to be so traditionally, the camera systems have been used in indoor environments. And so when we're talking about workplace screening, we'd ideally love to screen everybody before they get into the workplace, or we need an area to screen them before they get into the workplace. Uh, so for the camera systems to work effectively, they do need uh, the proper lighting conditions and outdoor temperature or environmental temperature for them to operate. And then uh, they're also, um, they're effective because you don't need a screener. Uh, so the technology now is getting to the point where it's just a camera. You don't need to have the screener doing the measurements. Uh, you can have, it will register their temperature right in front of them, and then it will tell them to pass or not pass, and it will alarm depending on the temperature. So most important thing to keep in mind, I guess, with this system is just the conditions that the person is coming from. So if they're coming from winter conditions, you do need to have them in an area to acclimatize for at least 10 minutes so that they can then go through the, the terminal. Uh, the other monitoring systems, all of them would need a, so they will all need a trained operator. Uh, and so we're, and there's nothing wrong with that, um, other than maintaining your physical distancing and all of those procedures as well. So a little bit of difference, the effectiveness, they're both, they all can measure temperature, but we do need to keep in mind the temp environmental temperatures of the workers. Thank you very much, Katie. Uh, the, next the next question is for Patrick. And so Patrick, um, different occupations uh, have different uh, PPE, so personal protective equipment and clothing uh, requirements. Now, is it possible like in certain workplaces that could block Bluetooth or change the signal at all? Or could you comment a little bit? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So. Think of it a bit, I'm thinking of it in terms of like a wall or something like that. Any material that a wireless signal can't go through, you know, easily is going to be problematic. Um, that really depends on 
the material itself. If we're thinking of a thick concrete wall, it's going to have more difficulty than, as the example I gave earlier, the air. Um, now, PPE spe specifically, um, it could be problematic, but if we're just thinking of people who are using it, you know, going to a coffee shop, for instance, well, your phone might work with Bluetooth headphones. It's going to be that same uh, principles. And some of these technologies, too, I'm not too sure about Bluetooth in particular, but some of these have error correction. So that essentially what we do in computer science is we give it all kinds of information. And some of the information actually has uh, checkers that you can use to verify the information that was sent as a means to confirm that the data was sent properly. But I'm not too sure if they're employing that. That's a, that's a great question. Oh, thank you, Patrick. And Katie, the next question is for you. Um, and this kind of ties back into um, how you're testing for different clothing and say toques and headgear. Um, so like whether like a ball cap versus say a bald head or a bare head, um, does that confound the measurement uh, did you find? Uh, yes, the, any of the heavy, we had tested, uh, like I said, we tested the baseball hats, uh, buff and headband. We also tested a uh, winter toque and hard hats and the effects of these. So these can change your surface, your forehead surface temperature measurement. Um, we only tested them at room temperature at this point. They change your forehead surface measurement by about two degrees, so they can influence the measurement enough that you could potentially overestimate fever. So again, just when somebody wears these to work or uh, comes through your screening, just uh, they do need to just take it off and acclimatize for at least three to five minutes, ideally, and then you would take their, their measurement. Oh, very interesting. Thanks, Katie. Um, and back to uh, Patrick again. Um, Patrick, do you think that uh, like an app similar to, uh, to the Canada uh, COVID app, um, will this enhance comfort for the general public in, in participating in group-based data collection in the future? Or um, like, do you think like as for potential future illnesses or even just flus or things like that? That's a great question. Really, uh, one thing they did really well with this app that I want to praise them for is it's a group of volunteers that developed it from a company called Shopify. What Shopify does is all kinds of business type um, applications. They help business build websites and such. So that technology is actually available for anyone to learn. So you really don't need to just trust anyone's word on, oh, this app is secure. You can actually go verify yourself. And I think that aspect is very important to help people be more comfortable with something like this because they themselves, uh, or if a friend who perhaps knows a little bit more about computers, can look at the code together and actually see if it does that, what, they, uh, what they anticipate it doing. Oh, very interesting. Thanks, Patrick. And Katie, um, so I know we talked about uh, both ear thermometers and measuring skin surface temperature. Now, when most people go to the doctor, they're kind of used to having like a thermometer put under their tongue. Is that something that's not really kind of on the table for uh, this kind of situation or this kind of uh, research? So we didn't actually use the oral temperature um, as a control in this case, just because our protocols uh, for the university are, everyone has to be wearing their masks. We're, uh, there's only allowed, we're only allowed two people in our lab. Uh, everyone has to be wearing a mask. And so oral temperature wasn't really an option, but the oral and ear temperatures can be pretty similar estimations to, um, the inner ear temperatures can be pretty similar estimations to core body temperature. So it was, it's, and it won't be a, it will be a great way to do mass screening in the future, just because you'd have to sanitize it or you'd have uh, throwaway ones. And so it's not the best option at this point. Thank you. Understood, Katie, thank you very much. So Patrick, back to you. Um, now, are there other technologies that other countries are using for tracking that other than, say, using an app? Are there other kind of technologies that's something that we could look into here or that different workplaces could look into if, say, uh, using like a specific Bluetooth phone might not be work in a certain occupation? Yeah, that's actually a great, uh, great point. I probably should have snuck it into the talk when I had a couple more minutes, but 
One country actually is Singapore. What they're doing is they essentially give a token to a person. Let's think of it like tokens. But really what it ends up being is a little Bluetooth device. It does exactly the same thing as the COVID alert app. Uh, the difference being you don't need to buy the phone. And what, what's more is that it, you know, it's a little bit easier to carry around if someone's not used to carrying around their phone. I don't know if that's so true nowadays, but uh, you know, I could just have that on you uh, without having to deal with the whole uh, digital interface, the digital virtual interface you'd have to get used to. And it'd be enough to have someone go near you to activate that system. It works, as I said, exactly the same way. So potentially that's a solution to that. Uh, there's all kinds of different ways. And I think together those solutions can help. No, oh, that's very cool. I didn't uh, know about that. Thanks, Patrick. Um, and turning uh, back to you, Katie. Um, now, so we talked oral, ear, and and skin. Now, breaking skin into two parts. Uh, what about wrist versus forehead temperature? Is there any difference? Is one better than the other? Um, could could a wrist provide like a uh, like a meaningful result? Uh, so uh, these are both kind of peripheral measurements. From your core body temperature, so forehead measurements, yes, they are compounded by wearing a hat or any kind of headgear. Uh, they're also compounded when your face is um, out in the wind; the surface temperature will change. Uh, we did some wrist measurements in our last. Uh, we did some wrist measurements in our last protocol. So, as far as it being more effective, it's we're just analyzing that now. Uh, it does also, it is your wrist and hands are also similarly affected uh, by any environmental temperatures or wind. And so at this point, it's not completely clear which one would be the best, but we, I'll hopefully be able to comment more specifically on that in the future. No, thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, I look forward to, I think we all look forward to hearing uh, what the, what the further results of the uh, of your research uh, on this will be. Um, so turning again to to Patrick. Uh, so Patrick, having Bluetooth on also exposes your ID to, to what are called Bluetooth beacons, uh, which may not be avoidable. Uh, most people leave their Bluetooth on anyway, though. Is there any worries with this? And could you maybe explain what a, a Bluetooth beacon is for people who might not uh, might not know? Yes, absolutely. Sorry, I must have slipped it into my last question, uh, my last answer rather. And, I apologize for that. I really like to define things. So Bluetooth Beacon is really a low power device that uh, is able to uh, receive a Bluetooth signal and uh, provides a kind of a unique identifier. It's really, um, think of it a bit like a chip on your credit card. You know, when you put it in to your credit card, I know this is maybe a little bit of a technical example, but it works in a similar way where the circuit itself kind of requires, as I understand it for the most part, um, the signal Bluetooth to make it work or some of them will broadcast their own kind of a bit like a lighthouse, their own light into, uh, into the world. And then your phone receives that and can communicate with it for things like uh, you know, web addresses that are location sensitive and such like that. So hopefully that helped a little bit get that understanding there. Thanks, Patrick. I think that, uh, that yeah, just cleared it up uh, a little bit. So thank you. Um, so Katie, at the beginning you mentioned um, Kind of doing a bit of review into like uh, back in SARS, uh, almost I guess 20 years ago. Now, was temperature screening ever used in SARS, or was it never really considered? Not there. Can, can you kind of relate to it to that to see if that uh, that played a role at all or was used? Sure. Uh, so with with SARS, uh, that was more wasn't as global uh, as big of a global pandemic. Uh, weren't as many cases and so we weren't seeing it used in, we weren't seeing temperature screening in workplaces we were more seeing temperature screening a little bit in travel and obviously there's been so many changes in technology uh, that thermal imaging and uh, the infrared laser thermometers weren't as well advanced as they are now so uh, it was used but just more specifically within the hospitals uh, and travel locations not not like we're seeing now with workplaces uh, entering grocery stores, especially uh, isolating our long-term care uh, facilities and making sure that nobody's going in there with a fever. It, it was not used that way um, about 18 years ago. Understood. Thanks, Katie. 
Um, and I'll uh, another question here for, for you, Katie, that we'll uh, jump back with. Um, now you kind of alluded that under some, you know, different environmental conditions, people you measure different skin temperatures of like plus or minus two degrees Celsius. Um, what would be an example of like the most extreme um, temperature you could see on the skin? And is that kind of counteracted by like your internal kind of body temperature? Sure. Uh, so in our experiments, uh, the most, when you're exposed to temperatures at uh, minus 20 and minus 15, even for as little as uh, five minutes, so there's no wind conditions. It's just that's the temperature, environmental temperature, for five minutes. You're simulated walking. Uh, this can vary your forehead surface temperature can now be 50, 15 degrees less. Uh, than we would expect it to see. So sometimes on those infrared lasers, you might see a temperature that says 20, uh, and it should be closer to 35, 36 degrees. And so this is the danger when we're talking about the potential to underestimate fever uh, with if you don't consider environmental temperatures. So you can always, you can say, oh, okay, people are coming in from the cold, they're fine, they're fine, they're fine. Uh, when in all reality, if you don't wait, uh, for their skin to acclimatize, then you're, you're not going to get a, an accurate reading. Understood. Thanks, Katie. Um, and we have, um, yes, yeah, so we have time for maybe one or two more questions if anyone wants to get those in real quick. Um, so I've got uh, one more question here for Patrick. And so Patrick, um, do you personally, do you have like the COVID-19 app and like, have you experimented with that yourself or um, can you talk a bit about that? Sure, yeah. Uh, the focus of our talk today was really uh, on the technical side. So naturally I had to experiment with it. So a uh, way we can do that in computer science is um, running the device, rather running the app on a device that's virtual so that we can ensure an environment that's not biased by anything. So what I really want to see is the experience as it stands for someone who just installed it, who essentially is a new you know, uh, phone user. Unfortunately, it's not possible on the Apple side of things because Apple doesn't let you install apps in this virtual environment, but Android does. So I was able to see that even as you go into the, what's called the Play Store, the App Store for Google, well, it actually pops up and says, here's the app right away, as soon as you open it up after a fresh new phone. And the issue with that is if I started running these on my personal devices, well, I've already been using it. So the issue there is I won't get that, that first time experience, which is going to be uh, what some people encounter. And I thought that was very important, hence why I'm testing it virtually. Thanks, Patrick. That's, uh, yeah, some good insight into how kind of computer science related research is done. So. Oh, very interesting. Okay, so that is actually all the time we have uh, for today. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Katie Goggins and uh, Patrick J. Trottier. Uh, thank you to all of us uh, for joining us today. And uh, don't forget that uh, we'll be posting these on the CROSH website um, so you can access these anytime. And please join us next week at 12.15 uh, on Thursday as we discuss managing the flow in the workplace uh, with industrial hygiene specialist Judith Nelson and Laurentian University professor Dr. Thomas Merritt. Thank you, everyone, and uh, stay safe and keep well.